Welcome to our ongoing series of videos having to do with spans and proportions of common spanning systems. Um, we've, we've talked about a variety of structural configurations in steel and wood, and now we're going to spend a little time doing some computations. In other words, we've discussed what these proportions ought to be, but I want you to get familiar with how you sort of manipulate them uh, and thereby understand them more, more effectively. And we'll begin by looking at uh, basically this item right here, which is a wide flange uh, steel beam. And we're going to look at some of the spans and proportions for that. So we're going to ask a question such as, a wide flange steel beam spans 30 feet between supports, so it's what we call a simple span beam. If it has proportions near the shallow end of the guidelines, how deep would it be? So we'll go look in chapter 1, section 7, um, under spans and proportions. And for steel, we have uh, corrugated decking. Uh, and down below that, we have wide flange beams, simple span. And as you recall, we said these can span up to about 80 feet and typically that's the limit because rolling really deep sections is extremely expensive and the equipment is very expensive and generally speaking if we go beyond 80 feet we prefer to do a plate girder um, in this case though we are only asking for 30 feet and towards the shallow end of the proportions the depth of this beam, which is that right there, is the length, which is whatever the length happens to be, divided by 28. So if we come down here and we want to answer this question, we've got this 30-foot span. Uh, we say D is equal to L over 28, and our span is 30 feet, so we write that in, and we do this division, and we come out with 1.071 feet. And then if we want to convert that to inches, which we typically do, we want to specify cross-sectional properties usually in inches, we will multiply by this factor right here, which is just another way of writing one. So we've put it in the square brackets to indicate that uh, that role uh, as a conversion factor. Um, and when we multiply those together, we get 12.9 inches deep. Now, uh, as additional feedback, steel wide flange beams don't come in every depth conceivable. In fact, the, they are rolled in very heavy equipment, which is very expensive, and we don't allow for every conceivable depth. We have certain standard nominal depths, uh, such as 10 inches, 12 inches, 14, 16, 18, 21, 24, etc. So the closest standard roll depth to this uh, 12.9 inches that we're looking for would be 12 inches. However, 12 inches would put us below the shallow end of the guidelines, but also, generally speaking, we tend to not lower the depth, but increase the depth anyway for safety reasons. But particularly when you're near the shallow end, you, you would not round down to 12 inches, but you would round up. So, uh, if we're going to do that, we're going to pick a 12 inch uh, deep beam. For the purposes of this kind of problem, though, we may typically just leave the answer in this form, but you should be aware of this modular uh, dimensions of steel wide flange beams. So, let's ask this question if we're going to span this 30 feet again between supports. What will be the proportions near the deep end of the guidelines? So we're going to go back here and we're going to look and we saw for the shallow end we were at L over 28, but now we're going to be at L over 18. So now when we run the math we say the depth is equal to L over 18, which is 30 over 18, which is 1.67 feet, and when we convert that to inches it comes out to uh, 20.0 inches. Um, this is not a standard depth in steel either because we make a transition from 18 to 21. So we could round this up to 21 inches, but then that actually would put us over the top of the standard range for deep beams, in which case one of the things that we could do is say uh, 
Well, we're going to throttle back to an 18 inch deep beam, which is still fairly deep, but it, we understand that it's going to have to be heavier in the weight of the cross section than it would have been if we could have had a 20 inch beam. Typically, to avoid all this uh, complex thought process, we're going to just uh, leave the answer this way. Um, but you need to be aware that your modular dimensions won't allow that. If you're doing a drawing of a building and you're thinking a given beam needs to be near, near the deep end though, you probably will draw it as 18 inches deep um, to keep you within the normal uh, guideline range. All right, so let's take this uh, wide flange steel beam and use it in a different way. Let's uh, cantilever 15 feet and then ask, what if it has proportions near the shallow end of the guidelines? So we go back here and we say, well, here are our wide flanges used as cantilevers. Near the shallow end is L over 14. So now we're going to run our math that the depth is equal to L over 14, which is 15 over four, 15 feet over 14, which is 1.071 feet. And then when we convert that, we get 12.9 inches. So again, based on the standard nominal depth, we can't really get 12.9, so we probably will kick it up to a 14. Now I ask the question, what if this same 15 foot cantilever is near the deep end of the proportions? So we go to look and we see the deep end of the cantilever wide flange is L over nine. And when we run that number, we get D is equal to L over nine, which is 15 feet over nine, which is 1.67 feet. And when we convert that, we get 20 inches. And again, 20 inches is not a nominal dimension. But what I want you to notice here is the similarity to the depths of the simple span beams. And I'll just go back and make this point that um, any spanning member used as a cantilever can span about twice as far used as a simple span. So we took two cases here. One was a 30 foot simple span and then a 15 foot cantilever. And so based on that, we should expect actually to get the same depth. So when we ran these numbers, for this case, we got the same depth as we got for that one. And for this case, we got the same overall depth as we got for that one. And this is exactly what we would expect to happen. Okay, so let's take another example. A steel plate girder spans 130 feet between supports. If it has proportions near the deep end of the guidelines, how deep would it be? So we come down here and this is plate girders. We're going to pick the deep end, which is L over 15. And by the way, you'll notice we have a certain set of proportions here for wide flanges, and then we have deeper proportions. So instead of L over 28, we got L over 20. Instead of L over 18, we got L over 15. And the reason for that is that plate girders inherently lend themselves to being as deep as we want them to be. And so in a sense, these proportions are indicative of more ideal structural behavior because we have this latitude in plate girders uh, to make them deep. In essence, the rolling equipment that's necessary to make wide flanges skews everything towards shallower dimensions. So if we run these numbers, we now say D is equal to the length over 15, which we said is 130 foot span divided by 15, which is 8.66 feet. Now we could convert this to inches, but at this point, the number of inches is large enough that it might just be better in this rare case for us to say that for this cross-sectional property, we're going to just leave it in feet. Um, plate girders can be made any depth, so you could make this plate girder exactly that depth if you wanted to. But keep in mind, these are just guidelines. And so typically, we don't like doing things like odd 
decimals of feet. But in this case, I might point out that 8.66 is almost 8.67, which is actually 8 feet 8 inches. So we might just go ahead and make it that depth. Or we might round it up to 9 feet or make it 8.5 feet. Typically, though, we try to pick dimensions that will be really easy to remember because every time we do something that's a little odd, it just complicates everything during the construction process. So try to think in terms of simplifying things as much as possible. And for a beam this deep, we could actually round it off to the nearest foot or the nearest half foot. Okay, so now let's talk about some trusses. We have a double angle top and bottom cord here with solid rod webs, or in the case of this set right here, we have double angle cord members, and then in some cases, well, and then we have uh, single angle webs. So for a steel parallel cord truss that spans 30 feet, uh, and it has proportions near the shallow end of the range, what, it, what would its depth be? So we come here and we look down here and we see standard double angle parallel cord trusses. We're asked near the shallow end, that's L over 24. So when we run the numbers, it's D is equal to L over 24, which comes out to be 1.25 feet. And when we convert it, that turns out to be 15 inches. And by the way, this drawing uh, shows those proportions. So the length of this truss from there to there is 24 times the depth of the truss. So another question we sometimes ask is, what if it has proportions near the middle of the range? And we often pick a, a number that um, is easy to deal with. So um, if we look here, we say this is L over 24, this is L over 12. It's not exactly in the middle, but uh, a proportion that we frequently pick is L over 20 because it's real easy to run the numbers. And that actually turns out to be a very commonly occurring depth is somewhere in the vicinity of that. So that's what we're going to do. We're just going to grab this proportion, which is really easy to run with. We'll say L over 20 is 30 feet over 20. Uh, which is 1.5 feet, and when we convert that, that's 18 inches. And this truss is drawn with those proportions that the length of the truss is 20 times its depth. Okay, well, relative to parallel cord trusses, just to finish this discussion off, we'll look at the deep end of the range. So we come here and we see that it's L over 12. And when we run those numbers, we say the depth is equal to L over 12, which is 30 over 12, which is 2.5 feet, which is 30 inches. And this structure right here is drawn to those proportions. So in summary, the one on the top is the shallow end for trusses. The one on the bottom is the deep end. And there may be some circumstances, some circumstances when we'll want we will choose to do something even deeper than this. But here's the shallow end, the sort of representative mid-range, and then the deep. And by the way, the place we'll typically do something really deep is where we have space. For example, if we have a res restaurant with a really high ceiling and we want to um, we want to support that with trusses and we don't want them to look like these little dinky trusses up near the near the ceiling, but we do want to keep the ceiling high because we want to be able to to uh, ventilate the space properly um, and, and get the odors of food out so that we're not mixing people's different smells of different foods. Um, we might want to keep the ceiling high, but put in a deep truss that just looks more logical. Um, and, and by the way, I'll come to an example shortly that talks about another situation where we might want to make the truss a lot deeper than this. We typically don't exceed this because if we do something deeper than this, it causes the building to become too tall. That adds external surface that we have to pay for and more overturning wind load and so forth. So we normally don't exceed this range, but there are situations where we may choose to do so.
Okay, so we talked about fink trusses. Um, we might have a geometry something like this. And so this question is, suppose we have a steel truss of this nature and we want to span 160 feet. What would be the depth to have proportions near the deep end of the recommended range? So we go hit, look here and we see that for the fink truss, these are the deep proportions. And when we run those numbers, we say the depth of this truss is L over four, which is 160 feet over four, which is 40 feet. And it would be nice if you knew the difference when I show you a truss, uh, you understand the difference between a how truss geometry and a fink truss geometry. Okay, so here's a really interesting example of a truss where we actually want to make it substantially deeper than the guidelines. We have the opportunity, we have a motive to do that, and it becomes structurally efficient and desirable to do this. This is a solar decathlon house that was created by Virginia Tech. Um, and it, this is showing it being transported down on the highway. And then this is another view of it uh, in transport. We have the support wheels on the back of the truck with something here that's called the fifth wheel, which is what supports this tongue coming off of this trailer. So we have a steel beam that effectively is curved like that and goes along under the bottom of this truck. And then it comes up on the backside and goes over the center line of these wheels and the span between this support point right here and the support point back here that's centered between all these wheels on the back. That distance is about 64 feet. Now it turns out that this beam, the depth of this beam underneath this building is 12 inches. So it's a foot deep and that means it's going to be unbelievably rubbery like a diving board to get as much building as they could within this volume uh, where they could have lofts or let in daylight or whatever to get as much volume as possible they wanted to make this floor as thin as possible and they also want to be riding just barely above the ground and if i recall correctly they said they had basically three inches of clearance underneath and then a 12 inch beam. Now this 12 inch beam, if it had to span 64 feet, would deflect more than three inches. So this building would be scraping on the highway as it flew down the highway and, and in, in a sort of uh, variable highway condition, I think they actually did report that there was some scraping anyway, but for sure they don't want the structure bouncing up and down and, and uh, massively being ground away by the pavement on the highway. So they need this structure to be really deep. So the strategy they used was they incorporated into this deck a truss. So here you see some of the web members of that truss and the steel truss that, that also helps support the wood decking uh, is attached with really sturdy hinges along here. So it is actually capable of holding up this beam. So this deck um, gets folded up against the side of the house. And then you actually see the understructure in the form of this truss right here. And this of course is another view of that same truss. Now the vertical dimension of this when it's in this position is eight feet. So the structural depth has gone from the one foot beam to the eight foot deep truss. And in fact, you could even use it in composite action where the eight foot truss is added to the one foot beam. But I don't think in, in the case of this structure, they went to that trouble because the eight foot truss is already, uh, wonderful in terms of its proportions and its stiffness and strength. So for transport purposes, the truss gets folded up. When it gets to the site, it gets folded down and produces this decking surface.
So here are the kind of questions that we want to ask ourselves. During transport, the structure spans approximately 60 feet between the support point over the wheels of the cab and the support point over the wheels of the back end. The depth of the I-beam beneath the structure is 12 inches. What is the depth of the I-beam expressed as a fraction of the 64 foot length? So we're saying the depth is equal to one foot, the length is 64 feet, so when we take a ratio of D over L, it's one foot over 64 or one over 64. And when we take L up here, we get D is equal to L over 64. So the question is, are these proportions within the recommended range for steel wide flange beams? And the emphatic answer is no, because the steel wide, band, wide flange beams uh, at the shallow end of the guidelines has a depth of L over 28 and L over 64 is really small. And by the way, stiffness effects go in proportion to the depth to the fourth. So uh, if you're cutting the depth in half or more, you're having a catastrophic effect in terms of reducing stiffness. So this is clearly way too shallow for anything. It would bounce horribly uh, in place, but also during transport. So for this project, depth was added to the structure by putting the trusses in the decks, which fold up into vertical planes on each side of the structure during the transport process. The trusses are eight feet deep. So what is the depth of the trusses as a fraction of the 64 foot span? So we have depth of eight feet, length of 64, D over L is eight over 64 or one over eight. And when we transpose L up there, we get D is equal to L over eight. So our next question is, uh, are these proportions within the recommended range for steel parallel cord trusses? And the answer is emphatically no. The proportions of the trusses are much deeper than the normal recommended range. But these deep trusses are actually desirable structurally and we would do it more often, but under most circumstances it wouldn't be economical because when we make the structure much deeper, we add to the overall height of the building. However, in the case of this structure, the deep trusses on the sides are actually allowing the structure to be shallower, which allows a thinner floor and a more voluminous house to be transported down the highway while still meeting the clearance requirements when going under bridges. So our last question has to do with how many times longer is the free span portion, that means the portion between the towers of the longest steel suspension structure described in the guidelines, than is the longest steel bow truss shown in the guidelines. So here was our question. Here, down here we got bow trusses which are spanning out to 700 feet. So this would be something like the St. Louis Rams Stadium, where it's not just covering a football field, but it's covering all of the stands in a free span mode. So something on the order of 700 feet. On the other hand, when we look at suspension structures down here, uh, they're on the order of 10,000 feet from there to there but that means the free span part is about 5,000. And actually, I don't know what the world record is at this point, but it's probably been pushed up around 6,000 feet or so, but we're just gonna go with this as a sort of representative um, high-end value for a span. So we're talking about roughly 5,000 feet from there to there. Um, and this is just a close-up that allows you to see that better. So we're going to ask how much time, how many times longer is the, is the suspension structure than the truss. So we're going to put this 5,000 feet over 700 feet, which is 7.1 times longer. And just to help you with the scale of this, we couldn't do this in the book because we would have required a page for this, which would have been extraordinarily wide. So we're drawing it here. This is the 700 foot bow truss. 
and this is that suspension bridge of roughly a 5,000 foot span from there to there, roughly a mile. It's a rather sobering comparison, which I want to make here because it didn't come across quite in the book where this thing was drawn on the same page, but it was understood that it needed to be scaled up by a factor of 10. That ends our discussion of computations for spans and proportions.